Hello and welcome to this very special uh, Northern Broadcast Service uh, Superstation broadcast. We are uh, doing a read through of arguably the best roleplay in TMP history for the King of Valhalla, narrated by the author, Prydania, former delegate, lead RP mod, and just generally a nice guy. And I was told to keep this intro quite short, so go. I thank you for the um, kind words, MJ. Uh, it's uh, great to be introduced by the delegate. Um, I, uh, I, I'd love to, to be able to say, yes, I deserve all that praise, or this deserves all this praise. <laughs> uh, honestly, this... RP is something that's very special to me because um, something this long and ongoing is something I'd wanted to do in RP for a very long time, and I just never was able to pull it off uh, until now. Uh, well, I say now, this thing started in 2018, and it's still going. Um, and honestly, I'm just happy that people seem to have responded well to it and like it. Um and I'm very honored that when the NBS decided to do this kind of thing, that, you know, uh, they asked me to, to, to kick it off, you know, you know, kind of reading RPs out. So for the King to Valhalla, just a, a few quick things before we get going. Uh, like I said, it started in 2018. It's still going today. I'm still posting in it. Um, I don't expect to get through it all today. I don't expect to... Um, get to everything. Uh, I figure, you know, I'll read as much as I can in the allotted time, and if, you know, maybe if people want to talk or ask me about it afterwards, we can do that too. I don't know. This is all very fly by the seat of our pants. We're kind of, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of doing this as we're going. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that Further King to Valhalla, by its very intention, is not in chronological order. I did this to motivate myself to write so that I could just basically write entries as I thought of them and I didn't have to worry about, oh, well, I'm not at that part of the story yet. So um, the timeline jumps around post to post. And I contemplated maybe reading this in chronological order, but I decided against that because if I just read it in the order it was posted, then all of you guys can follow along with me if that's something that you wanted to do. So I'm going to post the link in the general microphoneless channel if y'all want to follow along with me on that. And... Um, Again, you know, uh, the timeline kind of jumps around a bit, but the um, the timestamps are are there for a reason to sort of give you an idea of the chronology. Uh, the last thing I'll say, basically, just to set the stage for anyone who's not super familiar with Eris RP or even just um, uh, Prydania in general is that this takes place during the Prydanian Civil War, which was between 2002 and 2017 in canon. It was fought between the Syndicalist Republic and um, pro-royalist rebels, who are referred to as the FRE. FRE is the Prydanian acronym for Front of National Unity. So with all of that uh, in mind... Um, Let's begin. Um, so, post one uh, takes place um, 2nd of September, uh, 2002, 1.02 p.m. on a Monday, Beacon Svidi, Prydania. Caleb Stahl made his way to the office of Yannick Liefter, passing workers who were tire tirelessly chipping away at reliefs of stags etched into the stone of the walls of the hall, the Althingy building. He paid them no mind, occasionally tipping his head and offering a respectful comrade uh, uh, if they offered him one first. It wasn't that he was purposefully ignoring them. It's just that when the Secretary of Internal Affairs rang, you answered as quickly as possible. Comrade, Stahl said briefly, said briskly, finally reaching the Internal Affairs Office. 
The comrade's secretary is expecting you, the guard replied matter-of-factly. Stalm merely smiled and nodded, hoping the guard's reaction wasn't a sign that Leifter found him running late. Those fears, however, were dashed when the internal affairs secretary rose from his desk as Stahl entered, smiling. Caleb! It's good to see you. Come on in. Sit. Comrade secretary, Stahl replied, somewhat relieved as he took a seat. Don't worry about revolutionary formalities, Leifter insisted with a jolly grin. No need to stand on them when there's business to attend to. Stahl nodded. Yes, the summons I received was quite urgent. I trust things are, he asked, not wanting to say what was still on his mind. Still, an unsure look from Leifter first did out of him. I trust that the new government isn't in danger? No, Leifter replied assuredly. The incident with the Stormhaven was regrettable. But we've managed to overcome any overt threat to all our control of the country. The government isn't in danger. Not yet, anyway. Oh, Stahl replied, shifting in his seat. What do you know of the Revolutionary Guard's storming of Absalon's palace? Leifter asked, his tone becoming deadly serious. I know Prince Tobias escaped the roundup of the royal family, aided by royalist sympathizers. That's about all. Royalist sympathizers. More like sympathizer, Leifter remarked, with more than a hint of disgust on his lips. You're in military intelligence. Does the name Axel Skov mean anything to you? His name and reputation, Stahl replied, sinking back into his chair at the mention of Skov's name. Last he'd heard, he was retired. Hell, he could have been dead for all he knew. Axel Skov was at Absalon's palace. He incapacitated seven revolutionary guards and absconded with the prince. We've been searching all over the capital for weeks, and we've found nothing. Where, whereabouts of either the prince or Skov are unknown. Stahl nodded as Leifter spoke, feeling a sense of dread wash over him. We have most of the royal family in our custody. By Wednesday, they'll all be dead. It's the collective and unanimous decision of the Syndicalist Presidium that the continued freedom of the prince will undermine our right to govern, Leifter continued. But we govern on behalf of the workers. The common man. That's all the right we need, Stahl replied as he continued to adjust in his chair. That may be, Caleb, but there are certain wrong-thinking people in the country still. Pockets of reactionary and, frankly, medieval thought that will view this child's existence as a sign of the crown's continued prominence. Uh, Tobias Lothbrook may be seven years old, may only be seven years old, but he will be heir to the crown of Prydania following Wednesday's executions. He'll be the last of the direct line. If we're going to kill off that wretched institution, the child needs to die. Stahl knew exactly what that meant, but he was loath to accept it. Instead, he would rather have Leifter come out with it. The, pre the Presidium's agreed to this unanimously, you've said, he asked, despite knowing the answer. Yes, Leifter replied coldly. We want you to do it. Track down the prince. Kill him. By any means necessary. Forgive me, Stahl said, breathing deep. But he's only a child. He's not even ten. He's done nothing wrong. I know the prospect of hunting down and killing a child is bothersome, Leifter replied, but he's guilty by proxy every time a royalist terrorist kills in his name. Every time our attempts to bring equality and economic justice to this country are undermined, the child is guilty because he inspires those acts. This hasn't happened yet, Caleb, but Scob and the Prince aren't the only two who have gone missing. William Aubin has vanished. A war is coming, and we need you to cut off the head of the Lothric snake if we're going to survive. Otherwise, all of our struggle is for nothing. Leifter's voice grew tired and cracked, almost as if the thought of what he was saying was too much. I'll need access, all of it, then. I'll need to be able to commandeer military intelligence, the political officers, units I may deem useful. I'll need to be able to move freely if I'm going to do this. You'll have the full backing of the Presidium, Leifter replied with a warm smile. And you're authorized to do anything, absolutely anything you need to do to end this. Thank you, Comrade Secretary Stahl replied, standing with a salute. Of course, Comrade Captain Leifter replied, referencing Stahl's recently obtained rank. Stahl turned to leave as quickly as he could while still seeming professional. Was he loyal? Of course he was loyal. Children, though, that children, though, what he'd gotten himself into. Whatever it was, that would have to wait, because he needed a drink. Um... 
Alrighty. So that was the first post. Uh, second post, 15th September, 2010. So we're jumping ahead eight years. Uh, 7.02 p.m. on a Wednesday, somewhere around Darrow, Prydania. You've spoken to him? Not yet. Thought it best to give him some time. I'm not sure he wants to speak with me anyway. Skov shook his head, finding Aubin's explanation unacceptable. It's time to be a father, William, he said as he pat him on the shoulder. Leave the bullshit politics at the door. Remember, he needs a father right now. I'm going to go talk to Token Lily, see how they're holding up. William nodded, watching Axel leave. He felt a knot in his throat. His own daughter was young when she'd passed. He was utterly lost when dealing with the normal rigors of adolescence. And this... this was that, but so much more intense. War amplified everything like that. He hesitated as he was about to knock before he just opened the door. Tobias's sobbing had settled. He just lay there, looking up at the ceiling of the safe house, clutching a pillow to his chest. His eyes were bloodshot. Leave, he said, his throat obviously tasked from having bawled his eyes out. You don't look like you need me to leave, William replied, making his way to a chair by Tobias's bed. You look like you need to talk. I don't want to talk about it, not with you, he said, his voice not reg registering above a, wh a whisper. You're probably happy about what happened anyway. William clenched his jaw to yell at the boy, but his common sense won out at that last moment. He didn't need another shouting match of Tobias, not over this. Toke and Lily Brink are loyal friends, he said, trying to hold himself together. Whatever you think of me, don't think for a moment I'd ever wish this on them or Krista. Tobias turned to him, blushing a bit, and nodded. I'm sorry, he whimpered. William leaned back in his chair somewhat. I'm sorry, too. She was an innocent. And I know how much she meant to you. Tobias sat up in bed, clutching the pillow as if he were hugging it. I loved her, he said with a whimper, on the verge of tears again. William nodded. He'd more than once told Tobias he wasn't happy about him and Krista carrying on a relationship, that for someone in his position, marriage could be a powerful political tool. Never went over well, telling a 15-year-old not who was in madly in love that not to be in love was an exercise in frustration. I know you did. I know she felt the same way about you, William replied softly as he leaned in. Tobias broke down again crying, not hysterically, just quietly sobbing as he let his head hang. William nodded and got up from his chair to sit next to the boy, wrapping an arm around him. I know it hurts, believe me, he said as he held the prince. I know. It's never going to stop hurting either, but it gets better. Tobias's reservations about William being there melted away, and he rested his head against him as he sobbed. They, uh, they all die, he whimpered. William just looked at the boy, unsure of what to say. He, he didn't need to, though, Tobias continued. Mom, Dad, Krista, everyone I love. He said as he rested his head against William, everyone dies. William felt a pit in his stomach open up. He didn't have to imagine what Tobias was going through, his own wife and daughter, anyway. I felt that way when Elvida and Claire passed, he said softly as he held the prince. Everyone's gone, but they're, but they're not, and I have you. You're still here, and I know Alvi and Claire began to choke himself up. He paused, breathing deep, as he desperately fought back the urge to join Tobias in breaking down. They would want me to look after the people I love who are still here. Like you. Tobias looked up as he adjusted, sitting next to William. You mean that? William chuckled. You can think whatever you want of me, Tobias, but I've protected you for eight years. Maybe I've not done a good enough job letting you know I only want what's best for you. You're far more than a political pawn. Far more. He held him again, letting Tobias cry as long as he needed to. 
I've cared for you since Axel brought you to me. I never thought I'd get the chance to be a father again. But I've seen you grow into a kind and caring young man, and I love you, and you make me proud. William himself was on the verge of breaking out in tears. Tobias had stopped his crying and to listen, clutching William as he spoke. And I, and I know your mother and father would be proud of you too. And I know Krista's always going to be there, always. Just like she's going to be with her parents, always. Tobias had felt better for the first time since hearing Krista had died by stepping on a landmine. He didn't really feel better. The wound was still fresh and raw. He did feel less hopeless, though. William hadn't told him anything he didn't know, not really. He often felt like a pawn or a political symbol, but deep down he knew William loved him. He loved him back. He just, it just made him happy to hear it. He leaned against the FRE's resistant leader, resistance leader's shoulder. I love you too, William, he said softly. William wanted to tell him he was brave, to just be able to persist day to day, in and out during the war, for all the death and suffering that came with it. Still, he said nothing. He just kept his arm draped over the prince's shoulder. Over the hills and back, Tobias, we'll get there, he said, almost in a whisper, referring to an old Pridanian bedtime story for children that described an idealistic paradise. Tobias's body went loose, finally comforted enough to relax. A day's worth of grief and stress had caught up to him. I'll leave you to get some rest, William said softly. Just, I'll be in the common room. Don't hesitate if you need anything, okay? The prince nodded, thanking William again with another hug before the FRE leader made his leave, finding Axel Skov sitting on the main table in the common room of the safe house. You're an asshole, William. Never forget that. You're a good father, though. Don't forget that either, he said, breaking open a bottle of Brennivin and pouring two glasses. Thanks, Axel, William replied with a sigh as the two men toasted to staying alive for one more day. All righty. Uh, so... I guess we'll just keep on keeping on. Um... 4th of September, 2002... Jumping back eight years, 7.46 p.m. on a Wednesday, Jorvik, Prydania. William stared at the blank television. The buzzing of the recently turned off device still hummed through the room. Well, that's that, Skov replied, arms crossed. Oh, they're all dead. Toft, the king, all of them. William didn't say anything. He just sat there staring at the screen. If it makes you feel any better, Toft was a tosser anyway. And the king, well, best to think on what comes next. William didn't respond, still sitting there looking at the television screen. Ooh, boy, little author's note. Originally, Anders was named William. Uh, uh, sorry, was named Andrew. But I guess, yeah, this is an old pro post. So, King Anders wasn't a good man, he finally said softly. I had to keep saying he was for all those years, but he wasn't a good man. But it didn't have to end like this. Nielsen didn't waste much time, that's for sure, Skov replied. Robert and Hannah, though, they deserved much better. We all deserve better, William, but that's besides the point. Robert and Hannah are... Are you going to tell Tobias? How do you tell a seven-year-old child they're never going to see their parents again, William asked, still staring at the blank screen. I don't know, Skov replied dryly. That's not why, that's not why I'm here, he pat William on the shoulder. You're, you're not going? No, Skov interrupted. I'm not. I'm not the sort you want to be doing that anyway. Besides, you're the father. William sighed. Alavida, he removed his glasses to wipe away the tear. It almost made him happy to see Stephen Toft's kicking body hanging there. He gathered the strength, though, as Axel left the room. He hated the thought. How do you tell a child that? He rubbed his temple, about to give up, to make his way to the room... They were keeping Tobias in when he heard something. It was unmistakably something moving. The safe house they were in was old and cluttered. He made his way to the corner of the room, pulling aside an old chair, 
to find Tobias kneeling there. His eyes were wide and seemed to be on the verge of tears. William steeled himself as his heart had jumped into his throat. How he'd gotten there wasn't the issue. Children get everywhere. He suddenly had to deal with this now. Dropped to one knee and smiled as best he could, given the circumstances. Hey, what's going on? He asked the child softly. I, Tobias, looked up for a moment and then back down. Where are my mommy and daddy? William felt a crushing weight on his heart in that moment. Felt as if it took physical effort just to speak. There's a very good chance he had seen what had happened. If he was here while he and Axel were watching the television. Tobias, your father and mother, he began to tear up himself, knowing what he was about to do. Some very wicked people have taken them from us, he managed to say, his own lips quivering. They're gone, Tobias, and those wicked people, they killed them. He didn't know what else to say, he could only say it as it was. The boy's wide green eyes, which had looked like they were full of tears, suddenly burst as he began to wail, crying uncontrollably. William let his own head hang in defeat for a moment. He'd done all he could to have, he had done all he reasonably could to, in saving Tobias from the syndicalist hit squad that had seized Absalon's palace. And yet, here he was, a scared, sad child who had just been told he had lost his parents. How could he feel anything but failure in that moment? Tobias, he said softly, reaching out to comfort the boy, and instead, Tobias hugged him. William, shocked at first, smiled as he comforted the child. I'm sorry, I'm really, I really am, he said. Softly as the boy cried into him, he just embraced him, holding him, and letting him cry as much as he wanted and needed. He lost track of time when the young boy's crying finally began to taper off. Tobias, he said softly, my daughter was killed a few years ago. Like your mother and father, he placed a hand on each of Tobias's shoulders as he looked in at the distraught child. She was sweet and innocent like you. Some very bad people took her from me. You and I, we have to stick together because the world is a very dark place right now. Mommy? Daddy? Tobias whimpered, at, eyes closing again, crying softly. I know, I know, William replied, but you need to be strong because they're still with you in your heart. He tapped Tobias's chest, and you need to know they want you to be strong and brave, because together we're going to make the world not so dark. Tobias nodded, embracing William again, burying his face in his shoulder. Axel's going to make sure you're nice and safe, okay? He said as he stood up, taking the boy by his hand, but you need to get some sleep. William, will you read me something? The boy asked. He nodded as he sat the boy down in bed, looking for something to read. I'm afraid I can't tell a bedtime story, he said with a soft smile as he sat on a chair next to the prince's bed. But there is this. He showed the boy a small book with an old and worn brown cover, showing an embossed stag with a cross at its antlers. It's an old history book from, from years ago, from years and years ago. It's meant for kids a few years older than you, but you're smart, aren't you? Tobias, for the first time that day, smiled with a nod. Well, you see, William began to read, there was a mighty king named Harar, and he... William began to read the story of Harar Lothbrook, and before he knew it, Tobias was sleeping. Even in sleep, he looked sad. William sighed, setting the book down on the night table before leaving. That went about as well as could be expected, Skov replied as he sat himself down on a chair in the hallway just outside of the prince's room. No thanks to you, William retorted. Axel just chuckled. You don't want me to be the one who comforts children, he said as he shook his head. Suppose not, William answered, sounding exhausted as he walked off. Where are you off to? I'm going to do what needs to be done, William replied. 4th of September, 2002, 8 o'clock p.m. Still on a Wednesday, and still in Jorvik Prydania. So this is uh, William's little speech here. To all free Prydanians and friendly nations who receive this broadcast, I, William Aubin, duly elected member of the Althingi of the Prydanian realm, pledge myself to the front of national unity. We stand united 
to declare our intention to resist and rebel against the criminal syndicalist regime that has seized power in our nation. We believe in democracy and the consent of the governed, not the dictatorship of the syndicalist party. We believe in an organic society, not one of endless class struggle and bloodshed. We believe that the syndicalist regime has willfully and malignantly usurped the rights of all free Pridanians by illegally dissolving the realms all thingy. We believe that the syndicalist regime has engaged in political repression by murdering in cold blood members of the al members of the royal family, and all else who stand in the way of their ideological goals. We believe in the restoration of the Golnariki of the realm, including the reestablishment of a, fu- of a fully representative and democratically elected al under the Lothbrook crown. To this end, we recognize Prince Tobias Chiefling Lothbrook as heir to the Pridanian throne and rightful King of Pridania. We, the Friend of National Unity, declare our intention to fight and oppose the syndicalist regime and their forces by any and all means at all our disposal, to refuse any syndicalist law contrary to the rights of free people, to bring about the destruction of this illegal syndicalist regime, and to make forever free the peoples of Pridania. For the King, to Valhalla. All right, so I guess uh, moving on along, uh, jumping a few years ahead, 30th of October, 2012, 10.03 p.m. on a Tuesday, Stormerholmer, Pridania. And this is where things kind of get uh, uh, pick up. I can't believe the sword's safe. William's going to be ecstatic, Tobias remarked, holding Vodblad. One hand gripping the wood finish of the hilt, the other ever so carefully balancing the blade. The plate itself was memorizing, was mesmerizing. The metal looked to be liquid, and in the low, soft light of the cellars of Tempest Keep, he swore he could see it actually flow along the length of the blade. I'm sure Mr. Alban will be happy to see it safe and in one piece, Tobias. Jorn Studvatten chuckled as he observed the boy examining the heirloom. But what I'm curious about is what do you think of it? What do you mean? Tobias asked, holding the blade at arm's length as he tried to imitate how he thought fencers were trained to stand. It's a sword that's been in your family for, oh, who knows how long. To Aubin, it's something important, but I would think it would mean much more to you. I mean, Tobias looked at the sword, studying it some more. It's a sword. I'm happy it's still around. We all thought the syndicalists would have destroyed it by now with the crown jewels, but it's still just a sword. I don't even know how to use it. Studvatten chuckled, loosening the faded golden scarf around his neck, letting himself relax a bit. The funny thing about things as old as that sword is that they have a way of letting you know how you're doing, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. What do you mean, Tobias replied, sitting down casually in the corner, still studying the blade. I mean, that sword's seen an awful lot, so much so that it's probably had stories to tell, and seeing as you're the last one alive from the bloodline whose very blood was added to that steel, I suppose it'll speak to you before anyone else. How do you know so much about it, Tobias asked as he looked up. The same way anyone knows anything, Studhaven replied. Someone told someone else, they told someone else, they told someone else, until eventually someone told me. How much of it is true, Tobias asked, about the sword, I mean. I've, ho- I've heard stories. Pretty incredible stories. You want to know if the story of Asher Lothbrook is true, Studhaven replied with a mischievous smile. Tobias just nodded with eyes wide. Well, Asher, Sudhafen replied, removing his tan frock coat and setting it down before sitting on the steps opposite Tobias, wandered with his clan and their followers in what is now Andron, but at the time it was merely a wilderness. The Wendell, who claimed the wilderness, began to feast on Asher's host. Then Yadgar, God of the hunt and nature, heard Asher's prayers. He had a Forsma, blacksmith of the gods, forge a sword with drops of Asher's blood in the quenching of the steel. Yadgar blessed the blade, Vidblad, and bestowed it on your ancestor. 
With it, he vanquished the Wendell and made the wilderness safe for his people. Tobias leaned his head back against the stone wall. Yeah, but is there any truth to it? Sudhofen shrugged. What do you mean by truth? I mean like, okay, the Wendell, the pagan cods, all that stuff wasn't real. But was there a real Asher? Did he win a war against someone? You want to know if this legend has perhaps a kernel of truth to it, Stodhofen replied. Tobias nodded eagerly, and Stodhofen chuckled. I could tell you that the Wendell were some native group living in what is now Gothis, and that Asher, or someone based off of Asher, killed them. I could tell them the sword is just a sword, a well-made sword, but a sword nonetheless, and maybe I would be telling you the truth. Really, Lo, the legend that you felt the need to roll your eyes at is just as good a story as any other. But it's not true. Maybe. Maybe it is. Who are we to know? So old pagan gods, beastly Wendell, they're real? I know that according to legend, Aesir Lothbrook hated the Wendell so much that when the rest that would become Andrin began to incorporate their language in his own, Aesir demanded his clan follow... At his clan and their followers continue to speak the old Makari. I know that this sword was deemed important enough for some of your ancestors to die to protect it. And I know Aesir's descendant and your ancestor, Harar, only felt he could flee Herat because he had the sword to guide him through the storms and that and, and land on this chunk of land. Maybe they did all these things because of true story or maybe some fable, but in the end, a fable's as good as any other story if it inspires great people to alter the flow of history. After all, what do you expect people to say about you a thousand years after you're dead? Me? Tobias asked, blushing a bit. Hopefully that I got to be a good king, his voice trailed off, and I ended, and I ended a lot of suffering. Noble. Stoldhofen replied, but I will tell you right now that if the FRE wins this war, well, what happens during your reign will likely pale in comparison to the songs they'll sing about this moment in history. What do you mean, this moment? Today? Now? We captured Tempest home in the Austerlands, but we haven't won. Stoldhofen chuckled, loosening the scarf among, around his neck some more and unbuttoning the top of his white undershirt. No. This moment in time, not today or this month or even this year, but this moment where history is flowing between two points back and forth. He pointed at the prince. Me and Stahl? Tobias asked. Stood off and shook his head. Stahl's caught in the flow of history, but he doesn't direct it. He's pushed towards you by the other axis who determines this flow of history in this moment. Thomas Nielsen. Tobias just stared forward into the middle distance at the mention of Nielsen. He didn't say a word. Thomas Nielsen is a great man. A horrible man, don't misunderstand me, but a great one. Everything he knew was the working class. His father, his brothers, his friends, his whole town, his whole life was that mining pit. He had a burning desire to make things better for them, and in that passion, he turned to the path of absolutes. That didn't dull his force of will, though and he bent history to his design. And then there's you. Tobias looked up, pulling himself from the minor panic attack that Nielsen's name had brought on. You, the last Prince of Lothbrook, born after Nielsen's turn to totalitarianism, was irreversible, and before he seized power. God, gods, it doesn't matter. The universe abhors a vacuum. You're here to influence the flow of history from Thomas Nielsen. You're saying, Tobias replied flatly, that I was born to go through all of this? History is on the march, Tobias. In ten, fifty, even a thousand years from now, they'll look at this moment in time and they'll see the cycle of Thomas Nielsen and Tobias Lothbrook, two figures who directed the flow of history. So what do you want me to do, Tobias asked. Well, you can appreciate the sword, Stutthofen replied and understand its place in your family history, and understand that with it, Lothbrooks have shaped it just as much as Thomas Nielsen has. Tobias felt his stomach turn. I don't think the sword's going to win anyone a war, he replied. But maybe I can give it a few more stories to tell. Well, you'll have to li listen first. I'll try.
Well, that's all anyone can ask. Alrighty. Uh, 30th of October, 2012, same night, just a bit later, 11.14 p.m. on a Tuesday, Stormerhomer, Prydania. Jorn Studvatten had retired for the night, but Tobias had remained in the cellars of Tempest Keep. He told himself he felt comfortable here, that this was his family's traditional seat of power, after all, built by his own ancestors. And now, ten years after Nielsen's coup, it was in loyalist hands once more. He told himself that's why he felt comfortable. He didn't truly believe that, Lo. A creeping thought in the back of his mind told him why. It was a large stone building, and that was all. It was safe in ways he hadn't felt in a very long time. That was all. He got up from the corner of the primary cellar he was sitting in, the soft light, meaning his tired eyes weren't that strained, he grabbed the sword, Vidblad, and removed the scabbard again. The way the pattern on the blade made it look like liquid metal, it was almost hypnotic. Ten long years. Ten years. Stahl felt giddy. Aubin had tossed up an impressive counterintelligence network to secure the movements of FRE leadership. But now he knew where they were. Tempest Keep, or Tempest Home. Stormholmer. The FRE's capture of the island and the Austerlands was a black eye for the Syndicalist Republic. He was sure examples were being made. Retaliation against distrustful reactionary elements carried out back west. Maybe a purge of the Committee of State Security. It didn't concern him. It gave him focus, of course, but it wasn't at the forefront of his mind. Right now, he was ready to kill Tobias Lothbrook. He'd come close, but now it was imperative. Kill him, leave the FRE without their rallying symbol, pave way for the Syndicalist Republic to reconquer the East, and end this destructive conflict. The western shore of Tempest Home was rocky, but he had to climb the cliff to the old castle. FRE militia were patrolling the island, and nothing short of scaling the cliffs directly under the castle would do. Stahl gritted his, teeth as, gritted his teeth as he made his way up until his foot attempted to land on a smooth, weathered rock. He gasped as his body nearly tumbled, managing to hang on for dear life as the side of his body crashed into the cliff wall. It was he, it, it was even through the darkness of the night that he saw his pistol lodged loose, tr tumbling to the rocks below. He gripped the clip face, hoping that the gun wouldn't go off, eyes clenched and heart beating, until the faint clank echoed up. No discharge. He breathed a sigh of relief, even while cursing his luck. Ten years, and now he knew exactly where his target was, and he'd lost his gun. No worries, though. There are plenty of ways to kill someone, he thought, as he scaled the cliff face to the castle above. Tobias was lost in thought as he stared at the sword. Studhofen had said that he had to listen. You have stories to tell, he muttered almost to himself. I believe it, he added. But no one wins wars of swords anymore. Turn. He wasn't sure if he was hearing someone say something aloud, or if it was merely the faintest of whispers in his mind, less a full word or more an inkling that came out of nowhere. Still, it compelled him. He turned, and out of nowhere, the sound of a metal blade clanging against a metal blade echoed through the cellar. He deflected a strike. Stall strike. Tobias went white as he stared at the panting, angry stall holding a sword swiped by a suit of armor nearby, who had struggled to comprehend how the boy had managed to know exactly when to deflect the blow away. You, Tobias scrumbled just before Stahl lunged at him again, to your side. Tobias turned on the balls of his feet, clumsily dodging Stahl as he stumbled back. It was the faintest thing, an idea floating to the back of his head. He looked up at the ang he looked up at the angry as the angry he looked up at the angry Stahl and gripped the old bold um Vidblad tight. This is going to be over by morning, Stahl growled, lunging again. Up and block. Tobias raised the sword, 
gripping it with all the strength, managing to block Stoll's attack, gritting his teeth as he tried to hold the man's weight back. Roll right. Tobias moved low to the right, turning to force Stahl, turning, forcing Stall to stumble forward. You've run from me for too damn long, Stall yelled, swinging with all of his might. Parry. The prince parried, deflecting Stall's blow, and, and then he turned afterwards. But Skov can't hide you forever, you little shit. Stall continued lunging again. And again, Tobias matched the blow, though his hands were shaking. He wasn't sure how long he could hang on to the sword. He looked up at the staircase leading to the main cellar. He could hear the clatter of boots frantically running down the stone hallways. They're going to be too late, Stahl said, uh, through grit teeth as he lunged at Tobias again, only for the prince to turn, running, rolling along a column as a second strike from Stahl's blade hit the stone. He was quick, though, and managed to get ahead of the prince. He held his blade straight as he backed Tobias up towards the back of the cellar. The prince was shaking. He was sure the next blow would knock wide blood from his grasp. Stahl could sense his fear. Come on, say something. Say so that I can tell President Nielsen before I skewer you. Tobias held the sword as tight as he could muster. Nothing but the thought of wait came to him. Suddenly he looked over Stahl's shoulder. The door to the cellar burst open and he stared directly into the syndicalist operative's soul. Caleb Stahl had been chasing Tobias for ten years. He'd been within spinning distance of him more than once. And this, this was the first time he'd ever spoken to him. Tell Thomas Nielsen he can go to hell. Want, run. The prince ran and ducked to the side, and ducked to the side to dodge Stahl's strike, strike, and the bang of a pistol and clang of a bullet on steel reverberating through the heavy stone of the castle's foundation as Axel Skov, at the top of the staircase, emptied his pistol into the direction of the man he'd been playing cat and mouse with for ten years. Stahl ducked, throwing himself against the wall in the opposite direction as the prince. He cursed under his breath. The enemy had the high ground and firearms. He didn't have time to curse, though, and just dived into the cellar reservoir. Skov ran directly down the stairs as if he were 20 years younger, grabbing Tobias as he pulled him back, emptying his remaining rounds into the reservoir. Come on, he's long gone. We need to get you to where there's a signal. Tell the patrols, he dragged the prince, still clutching the sword after him. No luck? None, William, Skov replied, shaking his hand. Shaking his hand, Tobias just sat in the corner of the room, a blanket over his shoulders, as he continued to hold the sword, not saying a word. Aubin seethed, but quickly knelt before Tobias. You, you're okay? The shaking prince nodded, dropping the sword for the first time in a long time to hug William, nodding. I am, yeah. Okay. Stay out of the cellars tonight. We're moving out tomorrow. The idea of another safe house or bunker wasn't the most appealing prospect, but the shocked... Tobias could only nod. Yeah, okay, he said softly. William reached down, picking up the sword before turning to Yorn. How did you get this, Yorn? There's some very brave people who are not going to let that sword fall into the wrong hands ten years ago. I wish I could say I had more company keeping it safe all these years. William just nodded, holding the blade for a moment. You better keep you better make sure you keep this damn thing in the scabbard, he said, shooting Tobias a smile. The prince could do nothing but return in kind. And I think at Mad Jack's recommendation, we're gonna uh stop here. Um just because, you know, we want to keep this, uh, I think, like an hour. We, we, could, we could do the next two, and it'll be w within the hour and slash ten. I, th I think the next two is a good stopping off point anyway. Oh, like, the next like two? Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. All right. Uh, um, in that case, we will continue. Okay, so... Ooh, this one's good. Uh, um... So this jumps ahead to 2015. 27th of December, 2015, 1.26 a.m. on a Sunday, Eidervig, Prydania. Caleb Stahl tried to relax, his hands handcuffed behind the chair. It was a comfortable chair, he had to give it that. The snow fell softly outside. It was a peaceful, it was a peaceful scene from what he could see from the window. 
a low hill not too far off of the distance, a lone tree shone of its foliage and snow-covered fences against the dark blue midnight sky. The normality of it struck him. As to the north, Haddon. The battle was surely underway, and yet staring out at this window, you could be forgiven for mistaking the scene as an idealistic painting. You're not going to ask me if I'm comfortable, are you? Stahl asked with a bit of a smirk as Tobias entered the room. Tobias gave him a bit of a look, a bit of a fuck you for stealing my thunder look, before grabbing a chair and dragging it in front of Stahl, the back facing the former syndicalist operative. Tobias straddled the chair, sitting it backwards, crossing his hands over the top of it as he stared into the eyes of the man who had been trying to kill him for 13 years. He wanted to ask him why, but he also wanted to ask him so much more. The words log jammed in his throat, and he couldn't figure out what to say. Is there something you'd like to say? Stahl asked after a few uncomfortable moments. Why? Tobias began before the words disappeared from his lips, unable to finish what he was thinking uh, or what he was trying to ask as he told himself to hold himself together. Why what? Stahl answered. I've done a lot of things in my life I'm sure someone would demand an explanation from. My parents, my priest, Yannick Liefter, you. Then you know what I'm asking about because I'm not Lannick, Yannick Liefter or anyone else, Tobias replied as it took every bit of his own self-control to keep his composure. Stahl looked at the prince for a moment, then out the window again, and then back to the prince, not saying anything. You were a member of the soldiers' committees. You helped paralyze the army back when... He took a moment to breathe. Back when Nielsen staged his coup. It could have been stopped. It probably would have been stopped, Stahl nodded. Had we not done what we did. Then why? Tobias yelled, nearly standing before he forced himself to sit back down. I had to watch my parents die because of people like you. His voice shook, and Stahl, a bit uncomfortable, looked away for a moment before, his re before returning his attention to the prince. I had to see my mother and father die when I was a child because of you. I lost my family because of everything you did. Stahl, Stahl's jaw cl clenched. I don't know what there is to say other than the truth, he replied. Well, then what's the truth? I didn't care, Stahl said firmly but plainly. He could see Tobias's eyes full of anger, and yet he continued. I didn't care about you. Truth be told, I barely knew anything about you at the time. Tobias found his anger tempered by the shock of it all. Most of his life, he had, had been defined by people knew, knowing who he was. Whether they wanted him dead or alive was another matter, of course. You weren't the Lothbrook I was thinking of when I and my comrades did what we did, Stahl continued. Your uncle, King Anders, his fascist puppets were ruining this country. And God knows we tried to do what we could to change things peacefully, but you were seven when that happened. So don't question why I did what I did, because you have no idea how hopeless things were back then. How can I not, Tobias replied. My family's gone. My parents are gone. I had to watch them. He fumed for a bit, forcing himself to stay calm. You couldn't help it, Stahl replied. Could you? Where's William? Probably taking point in the fighting at Haddon, which you're welcome for, by the way. I'm sure he told you not to talk to me. I'd have told you that if I were him, but you couldn't help yourself, could you? Tobias was staring daggers in the man. After 13 fucking years, I'm, old. I'm owed answers. I already told you I didn't care, Stahl replied adamantly. Things weren't getting better. I couldn't... I couldn't... Now it was Stahl who was fuming, as the events of 2002 rushed back to him. He looked at Tobias, seething in his anger, and forced himself to remain calm. It's bad enough when you can't marry who you love, let alone be with them. Not without living a double life, he said, breathing deep. Tobias was dumbfounded. You're... you're gay? Your uncle and his fascist government, they didn't care about a lot of people, Tobias, he continued, feeling his anger melt away. A lot of us thought we could change things peacefully, but... but we couldn't. It was bad enough when police were allowed to harass us, even if we held hands. But I was in the army. If anyone found out who I was in love with, you'd be discharged. No, I would have been thrown in jail for ten years minimum, Stahl replied, correcting the prince. 
Syndicalists promised an equal society, a better Prydania. What happened to some child prince I barely knew anything about didn't matter to me, said plainly. And I did what I did so I could lift my husband and kiss him goodbye in the morning on the way to work. Then why did you turn yourself over to us, Tobias asked, his eyes, his early rage drained from his voice. Because of the harrying of Haddon, Stahl replied bluntly. I say I didn't care, Tobias, and I didn't. You weren't on my mind when I did what I did with those soldiers' committees, but when Yannick Liefter assigned me to track you down and kill you, I didn't want to do it. A child shouldn't have to die because of the sins of his family. But if that was for the greater good to safeguard that better Prydania, what's one child, what's one dead child, really? Stahl sighed. You thought the ends justified the means because if I died, things would be better? I didn't really. But that's where the ends justifying the means is such, is such an insidious idea. When Liefter told me to hunt you down and kill you, he never once mentioned a plan to burn every farm in the vicinity of Haddon to punish royalist rebels. He never once said he'd kill ten people for every syndicalist soldier killed by a guerrilla fighter. But he did tell me to kill one child. Just one child. Over the next thirteen years, it was more compromises. Until I suddenly saw all of those farms on fire. I saw hell on Eris, and I had to accept it was the side I picked that made it happen. Stahl looked down as he breathed deeply and collected his thoughts. If the information I provided your soldier ha provided helps your soldiers capture Yannick Liefter, then some good may come out of my involvement in all of that. Is your husband safe? Tobias asked, unsure what else to say to a man who had unburdened his soul to him. Stahl looked up a bit shocked that Tobias would ask him that. He is. William saw to it, he answered. That's good, Tobias replied. I hope you can see him again, he said, feeling a sense of guilt over his earlier anger, standing to leave. I'll leave you for the evening. Tobias, Stahl replied, I have something to ask you. Tobias sat down again. Yes? When you're king, if I'm king, Tobias corrected him. No, when? The FRE is going to win this war. How do you know? Because of what Nielsen and Liefter did at Haddon. The government's support's going to crumble. It's already begun, and it'll speed up after you take it. And believe me, you will if the intel I provided. So what about when I'm king? The people who support you now will celebrate. But there will be people like me. People who will be apprehensive. Scared. Angry even. Please, Tobias. Be a king for them too. A good one. And prove to them that they were wrong to assume the worst about you. I don't know if I can be everything everyone wants me to be, Tobias replied softly. But I want a fair and better Prydania too, Caleb. And that's all I can ask of you, your highness. Tobias chuckled awkwardly. Please don't call me that, he said, getting up to leave. I know it's not easy because of the chairs and the cuffs, but I hope you have a good night. It's better than it was an hour ago, ago Stahl replied with a smile. He breathed deep and closed his eyes, letting his mind empty as he tried to find some semblance of sleep. And, um, one more, I guess we'll, we'll hit one more and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this, uh, we'll wrap this up. 15th September, 2017, 6.04 PM on a Friday, somewhere around Darrow, Prydania. The war was over. Syndicalist insurgents were being hounded. The PGU, the Masordians, they were here. They were helping Prydania rebuild. And someday, in the far future, the war would be forgotten. Tobias wouldn't forget it, though. 
He'd shaken hands with foreign admirals, uh, corresponded for foreign to foreign leaders. He'd begun to understand just what it meant to be king, and yet he wouldn't forget today. The sky was gray, the wind blowing gently across the grassy field, the tree line in the distance swaying. The leaves were falling, and no one was here to bother him or talk to him. Axel, Axel knew. He kept his security at a distance to let him have his privacy. He sat down, his, ba his back against an old fence post. Hey, Krista, he said softly, producing a piece of paper from his pocket, sighing, his eyes heavy. I miss you, he said, breathing deep, wrapping his arms around his knees. Every day they need me to sign something or talk to someone or shake someone's hand. It's not so bad, I guess. I mean, I knew this stuff would happen once we won. I can't say I didn't expect it. He chuckled a bit, imagining Krista's smile. A smile she'd have when she called him a dummy all those years ago. But I wish you were here. To do it with me, because you should be here. You should be. He held back the urge to cry. Why? He wasn't sure. He didn't need to save face. Like we talked about. When we both would dream about the war being over, we'd be together. And he broke down, burying his face in his knees as he wept softly, not even trying to hold back now as he sobbed. He missed her. He always missed her. But the onset of fall and the gray skies of September made it worse. He finally composed himself. You'd have liked the coronation, he said softly. It was small, intimate. I know they did it because who wants to invite foreign dignitaries to a bombed out city, right? But it was nice, I think. Just the people who mattered. He sniffled a bit, resting his head against the fence post and looked up. You'd be there. And you'd be queen. I know it's kind of greedy to think of it like that, right? He chuckled. But we'd be together. He opened up the folded piece of paper he'd been clutching. It was a poem he'd written back when they were 15 years old and in love. Only seeing each other in the situation of civil war would allow it. He'd been given the poem back when she died. It died in this field after stepping on a landmine. He'd wanted to come back here for years, but they never let him. The Goyanians, though, had cleared the field. And additional tests indicated that it was safe, so here he was. Seven years after Krista Brink had died, finally able to visit the spot where she died and pay his respects in full. God, this poem is awful, he chuckled, reading the prose of his teenage self. But I guess it didn't have to be good, he said, looking up again. You kept it, he whispered, and you should have it again. He folded the paper up once more, digging into the dirt below him and setting the note down onto it before covering it back up. I know it's silly, and you tell me that. I know it, he smiled softly, but I don't care. I wrote it for you. Let it be part of Eris, the last place you stood on. He fought back the urge to cry again. I'm always going to love you, Krista, he said as he stood, wiping the dirt from his hands. He sighed and looked to the horizon, back in the direction he knew Axel was waiting. He smiled a bit, having fa finally found closure. Part of him thought it was silly. Why should he need to come here to this exact spot to bury some paper in the ground? He had already said his goodbye to Krista seven years ago. That part of him, though, he ignored it. He felt a weight removed from his soul now that he had done this. For the first time, he could think of Krista and not worry that there was something unsaid or undone. He stood there for a bit longer before taking out his phone from his pocket and dialing Axel. Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you for taking me out here, he said with a slight smile. He knew that his bodyguard would be here in no time to take him back to Beacon's VD. All he could and he could enjoy the trip back knowing he'd done all he could all he could ever do for the first girl he ever loved. All right. So that was um for the King of Valhalla um We are looking at, uh... Just over an hour. Just over an hour. 
Um, posts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven posts. Look at that. Um, so yeah, that was, um, the, the, the first seven posts of this RP that I have been writing, uh, for quite some time. It's actually kind of fun to go back and reread these posts and see stuff that I put in earlier posts that I kind of ended up like subtly retconning later. Uh, mostly names like Andrews was originally Andrew. Uh, the Revolutionary Guard became the People's Militia, but, you know, um, this was fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, I apologize for my lack of voice acting skills. I can't do voices. It, it's fine. The next thing is to fully cast a, a voice. Well, I was, I was thinking about that. I could, I could hold casting. And, uh... <laughs> uh, uh, well, the Kings of Valhalla is my favorite RP I've ever read. And I've been around on Nation States for about 10 years, at least. Oh, thank you. And it's it's honestly one of the one of my favorite things I've ever read. I genuinely believe it could be published if it was submitted to a publisher at the same time. Um, this has been really great. It's been, uh, it's, it's been fantastic to see you all come out as well however many people it was. I think the most we had was 16, 17 in here at one point. And um, that is all for this time. We hope to do this again with some more Fuller King to Valhalla and with some other RPs. And uh, yeah, this has been a Northern Broadcasting Service uh, production on the, the NBS Superstation in TMPRP. Thank you and goodbye. See ya.